Hi, everybody. Welcome to National Distance Learning Week. This is the last day of our presentations, and we're off to a great start this morning uh, with our guest speaker. I am actually going to turn this over to my colleague, Dan Feinberg, to give the introductions, and we'll take it away. Thanks for, for joining. Erin, why don't you go ahead? I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. I can do it. Um, no. Yeah, no problem. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dan Barancotta. Dr. Barancotta is an instructor at Western Governors University in the Education Technology and Instructional Design Graduate Program and an adjunct instructor at SUNY Genesee Community College, as well as at Niagara University and Bryant Stratton College. So if you're wondering if he has any free time, <laughs> very, very little. Very Dr. Little. Barancotta also works with the SUNY Center for Professional Development, instructing the SUNY Online Instructional Design Certificate Program. We're really happy that you're part of that program. He has experience as an instructional designer, as well as instructor uh, teaching courses in education, career development, computer skills, and computer programming. So welcome, Dan. Looking forward to what you have to share. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate the introduction and happy to be here with everybody today. Uh, today, we're going to get into and just talk a little bit about the importance of designing with empathy, really with the focus on meeting the needs of our modern learners. And I think this is a hopefully a really important and engaging topic for folks and a, a good way to think about things as we put together, um, you know, learning experiences for students, but really anything that we're doing uh, with a, a learner focus moving forward. And, you know, as uh, Aaron mentioned, uh, I work at Western Governors University in the Educational Technology and Instructional Design Program, but also at SUNY GCC. And then that SUNY uh, CPD program for the Instructional Design Certificate Program is something that we've just gotten going. And that's uh, been a really, really fun program to work with the CPD staff on putting together and, and offering. Um, it's running the first time right now, and it's been really successful so far. So um, hopefully if you're interested in this, you'll have a chance to uh, maybe even take a look at that program for a little more in-depth information on some of these topics. And, you know, as we get into talking about the, the importance of designing with empathy and, and how we want to try to meet the needs of our modern learners, I think it's always important to kind of take a look backwards to see where we've, we've been and how we've sort of evolved to where we are and what that means for where we're headed in the future. And I like to, to, to look at the field of instructional design sort of holistically in the way things have, have shifted and focused uh, over time to, to try to continue to adapt and, and meet the needs of those modern learners. Because, you know, as we know, things change over time. We're, we're, we're provided with new problems, with new solutions, with new information, with new desires. And, and, and with all of that, we need to sort of adopt, adapt and stay current in what we're doing. So, um, you know, this overall field, the idea of instructional design um, has, has sort of shifted uh, really from the development in the World War II era to where we're at now. And, and we've kind of had some buzzwords pop up throughout the, the, the those different phases. And I think those buzzwords and, and those ideas lead to a, a, an understanding of the focus uh, of where our learners are at and what they need moving forward. So, uh, you know, the idea here, again, is the evolution of the field and, and whatever we're doing. Um, you know, I really like this, this quote here, the point of human evolution is adapting to circumstance, not letting go of the old, but adapting it is necessary. And that's what we're doing with instructional design and where the, the focus here on empathy is going to come in today. How can we take what we've been doing, you know, for 80 years in this field, but really adapt to fit the needs of, of what we need to do today? And, and the idea of instructional design really sort of started in that World War II era when very quickly and rapidly we had to get hundreds of thousands of folks trained and ready to go do very particular jobs. And, you know, the focus there was on designing instruction that would meet the needs uh, of those learners. And, and the focus was really very much on sort of the overall learning goals and objectives and what we were trying to accomplish and how we could create sort of this one size fits all approach to, to best and most efficiently lead that large group of people and work towards sort of a, you know, an average learner. How can we prepare them to be successful and achieve those learning goals and objectives? And in doing that, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, benefit to that and we can sort of stay on track and we can work towards designing towards those goals and objectives. And, um, you know, we're working to help everybody that's there and try to do the best that we can. But when we're designing for that average student, so to speak, or when we're designing for that one size fits all approach, 
we really tend to miss the actual individuals that are going to be working through this material and, and the resources and, and engaged in the learning. So there's a, a big shift to a more of a human-centered design approach. And here, again, we can kind of lean into the, the naming mechanism. And this is designing with the human at, at sort of the center and the individual um, being the most important piece of the, the design here. And, and we really want to start to design um, with empathy to better understand the specific needs um, the strengths, the weaknesses, the, the learning styles, the way folks can and, and like to interact with material on an individual level. The more we know about that individual, the more we can provide uh, answers for that individual and resources for that individual to ultimately still achieve those learning goals and objectives. But again, rather than that one size fits all approach, how can we make sort of a size that fits each individual? And again, this is important. Designing with empathy is important, but it can be very hard to design something unique or different for every single one of our learners. That's not always the most efficient way to do things either. So again, we're, we're, we're constantly sort of evolving. And the idea is, you know, learning experience design is more of the, the buzzword that you'll hear now sometimes within the field and LXD or learning experience design. And, and we kind of think of this as instructional design plus a little bit more. It's still, again, the same idea of instructional design. But what else are we doing here? What can we add to it to, again, meet the needs of our modern learners? So we want to focus on designing for, you know, designing instruction for our learners and achieving those goals and objectives. But we want to do it with a real sort of design thinking focus that um, is going to hone in on the individual user experience. We're going to take everything that we've learned from all of these other fields that have changed so much um, since that World War II era, you know, web and software development and design, uh, technology, the rise of the Internet and mobile devices and social media. Um, you know, what we've learned about social emotional learning, how things have changed in terms of the way we look at and think about um, learning styles and, and things like that. And, um, you know, we want to take everything that we've learned from all these different fields and bring it together into sort of where we're at now, where we're creating really good instructional design, where we're in this sort of phase of learner experience design. And, and I think uh, when I think of learner experience design and I think of where we're at in the field today, it's all about designing experiences for our learners. And we do that through continuous and constant iteration where we're, we're constantly evolving, trying to find what is working and what we maybe need to do better um, or where there's room for improvement. And ultimately this is a, a focus on our individual students and how we can create learning experiences that are engaging for them, provide them with the resources and materials that they need and ultimately deliver us towards achieving those learning goals and objectives um, that we're after for the entire group. And um, again, the focus here is really on sort of what are those modern needs and, and how do we go about doing it? So how can we cultivate the things that we've learned, the things that people expect when they're um, on social media, the things that they expect when they're playing video games or when they log into a website or the way that they interact with their news and um, do research, all of those things have changed. And um, we have to then uh, evolve with that and change with that in order to provide instruction that's going to help engage and in, in teach our learners. And um, that's what we're ultimately trying to do is bring all that together here into the learning experience design field. So, you know, why is all that important to know and to contextualize and think about? Again, it's just, I think, recognizing how things shift and evolve and the importance that we're placing on empathy now in design because of what our folks are, are expecting um, from everything that they, they engage with on a day-to-day -day basis and their learning experiences are no different. So, um, you know, there always is this need to innovate. This is a really good quote that I love from George Kuros. Um, There's a clear need for innovation in education. Without innovation, organizations cease to exist. If education leaders refuse to evaluate and stay in touch with students, needs schools will fail just like businesses that don't keep up with the changing customer needs. And I think this is really important because, again, it emphasizes the need to evolve, but the need to understand, you know, what the needs of our, our target population are, our learners, and ultimately also thinking of those learners as our customers. And how can we sort of serve our learners? How can we serve our customers? How can we provide them with what they need in an ever-changing um, society? And, and the, the, the field of education is, has shifted and changed so much. Um, you know, really over the last decade, especially even, you know, coming out post-COVID, um, there's so much different about the way folks want to interact with their learning experiences and the ways that they're able to do it. 
we want to make sure that we're we're allowing for folks to find what they're looking for and engage with these materials uh, in ways that are, are meaningful to them. The analogy that I like to use here to kind of sort of set the stage for this is if we think about, you know, how we have have shopped historically compared to how we tend to shop now. And if we think about, you know, going back several years, we were more focused on going to those big box stores for the holidays and for our shopping where, you know, you'd go to a store like JCPenney's or Bonton or Macy's. And, um, you know, the store was put together by some folks that spent a lot of time thinking about what's the best way to to put this store together, the, to lay it out, the types and of materials and um, goods that we want to sell, the sizes, the colors, the style. How are we going to put these, uh, you know, near entrances and exits? And how are we going to put all this together? But we're creating one store, and we're creating that one store for anybody that might come into the store. Um, and it's it's the same experience for every one of our shoppers, and and all of our shoppers are required to go to that store. And it's, uh, you know, we don't know necessarily if they're going to have what we're looking for, if our size or style or color is going to be there. Um, we're all experiencing that shopping in the same way. We all walk in the same door and we all have access to the same goods and merchandise. It's all presented to us in the same way. We all have to go there at the same hours that the store is open. And that's really sort of the idea of instructional design. We're, we're trying to do the best we can for everybody, but we've got sort of this one thing that we're putting out there in front of everybody. And we've seen such a shift in the way that we shop to, you know, the more online shopping, but really specifically Amazon has cornered the market because of the way they create an experience for the individual. And I think that's the, the focus here when, you know, when we see Amazon and the way Amazon works in online shopping, you know, we can log on anytime, anywhere we have access to the internet. We have access to hundreds of thousands of goods and products right away. We can tell, you know, if it's in stock, do they have our size and style or color? And if not, what's a similar product we could get? You know, they've, they've solved the issues of, of hassle-free shipping and returns and things like that. And I think the most important thing to take away here is, you know, if all of us were to pull up Amazon accounts right now, we would all see very different things because, um, you know, Amazon is focused on your experience and finding what you need and what you want and what you've looked for. So they're going to take a look at those previous search histories, previous purchases. They're going to prompt you with things that you might need next. And it's all about creating that engaging experience that keeps you coming back for more, but provides you with what you need, when you need it, and how you need it, so that you're able to interact with that platform in ways that are meaningful to you to find what you need, to complete your shopping and do it you know, on your own time sake. And even sometimes we end up with a few extra things we didn't know we needed, but Amazon knew better for us um, and prompted us with that. But that's the idea of how can we sort of predict and make these um, you know, unique experiences for the shopper. That's what we want to try to do uh, with our learners now today, because the, the reason Amazon is successful is because people are shopping on Amazon more so than going to that big box store. That's what folks have come to sort of expect uh, when they're when they're shopping and what they've come to expect from the way that they engage with a lot of their information and resources that are out there. So um, we want to try to do that same thing here when we're putting together learning experiences. So, you know, today, what, what is it that, that matters to our modern learners? And I think we could, you know, we could have a, a conversation around this that could last all day. And, and again, the idea that every person is unique is the important takeaway here and um, recognizing that each class and each school and each, each um, program might be a little bit different and things are going to continue to evolve. But some things to sort of keep in mind that we want to make sure we're, we're always uh, are sort of at the forefront that are important to our modern learners today is that idea of personalized learning experiences. Just like we like that personalized shopping experiences, our learners want to sort of fit their learning experience to what fits in their life. Are they working? Do they have a family that they're concerned with? Um, what's their, their schedule look like in terms of, of time and, and when they're able to engage with resources or go to a class or to, to study online? These are, are different things that um, weren't available to students years ago, but are now. And, and students are trying and, and want to take advantage of that so that they can fit sort of their education around their life rather than their life around the education. And, um, you know, when we can personalize those experiences and provide for adaptive learning, again, another topic we could spend a lot of time on, but the idea of adaptive learning, that things are going to change and adjust and tweak along the way to fit the needs and provide for some autonomy for each of our learners is a really important thing to keep in mind. 
technology integration is huge. I think folks have come to expect to use technology everywhere in their life. Um, you know, we tend to be attached to our smartphones as a society. Um, that's how folks engage with everything from shopping to the news to ordering food now, um, communicating with friends and family. That's a key and integral part of our society. And we have to recognize that, I think, in terms of education as well. How can we leverage these tools? How can we leverage the platforms and the, the, the tools that our students are using to uh, engage them and to interact with them and to provide them resources at which they can learn from, you know, that can fit in their pocket and they can pull out when they have that time. So how can we integrate different resources and tools? How can we, you know, maybe use things like YouTube videos and, um, you know, robust web platforms that that fit to, um, you know, smartphones as well as um, desktop computers rather than just a textbook to learn and sort of um, work through? How can we use that integration of technology in our courses? And then we always have to make sure that we're engaging our students and, and that things are interactive. We, we've seen sort of, you know, that shorter attention span, I think, in our students, it's safe to say, relative to maybe when we were in college or when we were growing up or the way that we learned, um, things are different, but so much is different, right? You know, that idea of social media and even, um, you know, the TikTok videos, we're, we're down to like seven or 10 seconds to where we can really engage folks. So how can we hook them in? How can we leverage and use these multimedia tools and different interactive elements to, to engage folks where they're expecting sort of this graphic design type feel to a, a online class? It's no longer just sort of we log in and whatever the platform looks like, they want to be engaged by it. Again, if we're online shopping, if we go to a website and it looks like it was designed in, you know, 1992, we're probably not going to spend much time shopping there. It's probably not going to be as engaging or colorful or as interactive. We're just going to sort of get bored from it and move on to a different site. And that same is true if we're in a Brightspace class or a Blackboard class or whatever it might be. If we're not engaging our learners with things like, you know, stock images and videos and, um, you know, clear use of templates and design that's interactive, our folks are going to sort of become bored of that and maybe dismissive of that as well. So how can we leverage those things that we've learned to create sort of an engaging and, um, you know, just a visually appealing place where folks feel welcomed and they feel like they're in a modern learning experience. It's They're going to sort of uh, equate that. What does this look like? compared to what do I see in other places when I'm on the internet? And if it doesn't line up, if this looks sort of old and dated, whether the content is or not, that's going to be sort of the feeling that, that leaves with our students. So, um, you know, keeping them engaged, keeping things looking current, uh, I think is really important. And then how can we continue to engage folks? You know, I, folks do still, I think, really enjoy, um, you know, that collaborative experience and working with their peers. And I think, even if we're learning online, I think a lot of our students still sort of um, want that engagement and want that interaction with folks. Again, the way especially young people today are growing up and communicating with their friends and their family, um, their classmates, a lot of that is done through screens and behind screens and through text messages and messaging. So, you know, those face to face interactions that, you know, I think we maybe grew up with or that we sort of traditionally think about as being the the, the key components of a collaborative experience or building a relationship where you need those face-to-face -face conversations or even um, audio conversations, that's not necessarily true of the modern learner today. They, they build really strong relationships and, and oftentimes prefer to build those relationships behind screens and through text-based communication. So, um, you know, allowing those opportunities is still really important. I think trying to find ways to uh, allow students to collaborate, whether it's in discussion boards or group work, even in an online setting is still really important and something that they're looking for. Inclusivity and diversity and providing for equity are obviously the key cornerstones of every, anything that we're doing uh, anywhere, but that's again important here to our modern learners as well. Um, that idea of an inclusive environment where everybody's sort of welcomed, but there's something here for everyone where um, you know, it's it's inclusivity and diversity when we think about race, religion, gender, all of these different things, but also in terms of learning as well. And how can we represent these different perspectives um, culturally, but academically as well? And not just the materials that we're learning, but the way we're engaging with those materials. So do we offer a diverse sort of set of um 
learning resources? Are there videos and articles and web pages? Are there text-based books and options that students can interact with as well? And I think that's an important piece of that idea of, of inclusivity and diversity that's, that's also um, beneficial to our students and what they want. They want to see things from different people. They want to see, um, you know, videos that are from a diverse group. They want to read articles that are from diverse authors, and they want to see those different perspectives and sort of bring them together to make their own decisions. Anytime we're using, uh, you know, web-based products, especially, I think accessibility is really important. And again, this kind of comes into play with what our learners are seeing in other places. Um, you know, when you watch a video on YouTube or you watch a video on Facebook, now you're seeing those closed captions with videos. That's really important because, you know, a lot of folks are going to pull up their phone when they're, um, you know, maybe at a place where they can't listen to that video, but they still want to watch that video and interact with that video. The closed captions offer folks an opportunity to read those captions while they're watching the video, while sort of still, you know, remaining maybe incognito and not having that noise playing. Um, you know, and that's important to folks on a day to day basis. And that's also obviously really important to, you know, maybe a student that has a hearing impairment where they can't hear the audio of that video. We need to make sure they have the text based component as well. But when we design for those specific accommodations, we're also designing, I think, to create an experience that's better for everybody for a lot of different reasons. And when we can use different tools and resources that allow students to interact with materials in the way that they best see fit, fit at that appropriate time, we're making something that's going to be there for them when they're ready for it. If, if a student has a few minutes to watch a video on their, you know, at some downtime at work, but they can't listen to it, but they can read those um, closed captions, then that's time that we're getting them engaged in our course that we might otherwise miss and they might not be able to, to get their work done that week. So um, always thinking about those different principles of accessibility, uh, making sure that students are able to work through and read and understand um, and operate what we're asking them to do. Are they able to navigate through our course sort of in a simple and clear way? We don't want um, folks to, to struggle with that operability principle of accessibility where they're getting lost along the way and they're not sure what to do, where to do it, or how to do it. And then our learners are always looking, I think, for a, a chance to provide feedback, but also get feedback. And in this idea of a feedback loop, I think is really important um, for us as designers and instructors, but also for our students as learners. How can we create these feedback loops where we're regularly uh, providing feedback in both directions and we're having constructive conversations about what's going on? And I think, you know, the idea here is that we want to continue to teach through our feedback and continue to provide guidance and instruction through our feedback to help, you know, point students in directions that they can learn um, Based on their performance, how things are going, we can identify strengths and weaknesses, and we can provide feedback that's going to push them towards achieving those learning goals and objectives. But also when we give students a voice and they're able to provide some feedback back to us, whether that's through course surveys, um, you know, open discussion boards, or, or providing students with options along the way um, to have choice even, um, we're giving them a voice and we're empowering them. And I think our students appreciate that. Um, our students have come to expect that, that idea that they can provide their feedback and they can get what they're looking for and they can ask a question to get what they need. And, and we wanna give them that opportunity to do that here as well. So with all that being said, how do we put this into practical use? What do we actually need to do? How can we actually start to um, you know, design our learning experiences with empathy? And I think that's where the design thinking model comes into play and, and the idea that we want to sort of shift to this nonlinear approach that really hones in and focuses on iterative design. And, and when I say nonlinear, I mean that we're not going to follow a specific order where we have to go step A, B, C, and D. And what we you know, sort of finish with is what we're stuck with. And when I say iterative design, I say that in, in terms of we, we know that we're never really going to have a finished product. Um, you know, a, a particular module or assessment or whole course is never really done. We want to go into this design process realizing this never stops. We're always making new and updated iterations. And every um, time that we teach a course, 
or we go through a particular lesson, there's probably going to be a way we can do it better and we can make some tweaks and, and adjustments along the way. And we want to do that. We want to um, embrace that idea of constant iteration for improvement. So if we leverage and use the design thinking model, you know, there's there's five main sort of stages here of the design thinking model. But again, the, the focus is that we don't necessarily have to go in order, that we want to use what we're learning and seeing in each stage of these to help inform the other stages and, and constantly make those changes and adjustments um, sort of on the fly in a very agile approach where we're not forced to wait until the end and then go back and start all over. So, um, you know, within the design thinking model, we see uh, a huge importance on empathizing with our target audience and with our learners. The more we know about our learners, what they desire, but also what they need, where are the, the learning gaps, um, what are the their learning sort of preferences and what do they need to know and, and how do they like to engage with this material, the better suited we're going to be to sort of define those problems and define those learning goals and objectives. And what is it that we're ultimately trying to accomplish? And when we have a clear idea of where we're headed and what those learning goals and objectives are, we know where we want to go. I think it tends to be a little bit easier to get there. And we can start to develop different ideas in this sort of ideation stage where we're brainstorming a lot of different ways to do things. There's not necessarily just one way ever to do anything. And when we can think about a lot of different ideas, I think we'll tend to um, start to combine those ideas. One idea might lead us to another idea. We never know what might ultimately work and what we might settle on. So when we can generate a lot of those different ideas, I think that's really helpful and important here. And from those ideas, eventually we're going to want to sort of prototype or build out those ideas. And this is where we're actually creating our learning resources, our assessments, our courses. Uh, you know, And if we can build these sort of bit by bit, we can then get it out for testing. And, and when we test, that's an opportunity for um, you know, a new lesson or a new assessment to go in front of our learners. And, and we can get some feedback from them and we can kind of see, you know, were they engaged by this? What was the participation? Um, how long was it taking students to do it? What did they say or think about it? Were they confused in a certain area? Can we clarify something? Can, is there another way we can do it? Can we solicit uh, feedback right from our students and give them an opportunity to share their ideas and thoughts on that um, particular learning resource with us. And, and all that information that we learn from that testing and that feedback, we can use to more, you know, clearly empathize and define with our learners. We can generate new ideas and build out different prototypes and then get it back out there for testing. So, you know, when we think about this, I think it's, again, that idea of constant iteration. If we've got a 10 module class, Maybe instead of designing all 10 modules and putting it out in front of our students when we've spent all that time and energy, can we design just one model, uh, module and get that one module out for testing and see what our students like and what they don't like? How did they interact with this? How were they engaged with this? What worked? What didn't work? And take that information and use that to help us make changes to module one, but also to design module two. So now we're continuing to sort of learn more and more about folks and what they want and what they need. And it's helping us in this sort of step-by-step -step way where we're designing kind of by chunking uh, and, and building sort of bit by bit to make sure that we're ultimately getting what we need at the end. And, uh, you know, it's a good way to just kind of think about things, but to make sure that we're being efficient along the way and we're not stuck with a 10 module class at the end that really is sort of, uh, you know, not connecting with who our learners are, but we spent all that time and energy and effort on it. And we're just going to end up sticking with it because that's what we've got. Can we do this sort of in a step-by-step -step, more um, agile way to kind of work through these ideas and, and find what's going to work for our students? And just in general, you know, what we want to make sure we're always keeping in mind here is, is with the power of empathy and design and keeping empathy sort of at the forefront is, you know, how can we reflect on what we're doing during that design process, but also during that iteration process and, and while these courses are running and um, in front of students? And can we continually to challenge ourselves to solicit feedback and see things from another perspective? Because I think we tend to sort of see things from the way we are, are looking at it. And, you know, when we put a course together, it makes sense to us because we're the ones that put it together. But is it necessarily going to be clear how to navigate or what's expected of our learners um, when they look at it? And we've got to put ourselves sort of in their shoes and see things from their perspective. 
And we have to remember, you know, when we're designing and when we're creating classes and when we're teaching classes that, you know, generally that's going to be something that we're the subject matter expert on. So it makes sense to us. Again, um, you know, you have likely spent a lot of time learning a particular topic and that's why you're teaching it. So it's going to, these ideas are going to sort of connect to you much more clearly than they are to our students. And, um, you know, what's obvious to you might not be obvious to someone else. So again, putting yourself in those other shoes uh, as somebody that's learning this for the first time, not somebody that's a, a veteran teacher in that particular topic. And then I think whenever we're teaching or designing, we have this tendency to do things um, the way they were done for us. So a lot of times we teach the way we learned. Um, we use our past teachers or instructors or faculty members sort of as examples for what to do. And we do that even subconsciously sometimes. And even when we know that we struggled learning in that particular way, we have a tendency to still sort of take that you know, lecture style, for instance, and use that and push that onto our students. And I think it's really important to recognize that just because we learned this way or it was done in the past doesn't mean that's the way we should be doing it today. Again, so much has changed. Um, you know, you can go back and think 80 years to the beginning of instructional design. You can go back and think 30 or 40 years to the rise of, of the internet. You can go back and think, you know, 15 or 20 years to the rise of, of smartphones. You can go back just three or four years and think about, um, you know, COVID and the pandemic and the way remote learning changed. So much is changing and continuing to evolve. What worked previously is very likely not the best way to do things today. And, you know, our younger students especially are growing up in a very different age and style. They're, they're coming of age using these different technology tools and interacting with materials in different ways. And that's what our modern learners are expecting. And that's what we need to find a way uh, to, to share with them. Um, you know, and then I, another thing that I always like to think to and make sure that we recognize is, is can our students sort of see the forest through the trees? When we're, we're putting together these learning experiences, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into this. There's a lot that we're asking them, them to do. Uh, but can they, do they understand the big picture? Do they recognize sort of the learning goals and objectives and where they're headed? Can they see the forest? Do they see everything or do all they see those individual trees? And when we can kind of look at things holistically and present them in a context for our learners, I think they're much more likely to connect with that and feel comfortable and confident sort of progressing through as well. So um, making sure that, that along the way, we're always sort of giving that big picture to our learners and letting them know um, you know, where we're headed, why we're doing things throughout that process, how these ideas are going to connect down the line is really important. And, and when they do that and they have a, a vision of where they're headed, they're more likely to continue down that path and not sort of hit, you know, one tree, so to speak, and get stuck and stop there. And, and that's what we see too often is uh, online students, especially running into a trouble point and just sort of giving up at that point because they don't see a way around that tree. They don't see a way around that particular assessment or piece of content. How can we get them through that and around that and to continue on and to stay engaged in what we're doing and, and where we're headed? And, and so, you know, as we're de designing, you know, going through that process, I think as you have a good design in place, we wanna continue to iterate that and make those changes, as I mentioned. Some things that we can always be asking ourselves and we can be asking of our students are, you know, why am I doing it this way? Is this the best way to do it? Is this the, you know, is there a reason why I'm doing this? Is it just because it's the way I've always done it or the way I learned it? Um, do my students like this? Are they engaged? Are they watching these videos? Are they reading this content? Are they completing this assessment? Um, what are they saying to us? I think another key piece of information that we often overlook is how are our learners performing? Um, you know, if we're giving an assessment and students either aren't completing it or are really struggling with that assessment, I think that's a, a question we need to ask ourselves. Am I teaching this in the right way to prepare our students for this assessment? Or is this maybe the best way to assess students? Is there an alternative way students could demonstrate their learning, um, you know, as it relates to the content and the goals and the objectives, as opposed to the way I'm doing this? Because, um, you know, if our student, if large scale, we're seeing students struggle, let's not blame the students. Let's look more introspectively and find different ways to do this. You know, is there a better way to assess? Is there a better way to teach? And then ultimately, you know, would I want to be a student in this class? Again, that the idea of being empathetic, you're asking your students to do something. Is that something you would be willing to do if you were in their shoes? Is that something you would find to be just busy work or not helpful or is what you need to learn there? And those are important questions to sort of think about. 
I'm just going to check the chat here. Yeah, good question, Aaron. For folks that want to maybe share in the chat, how can we sort of think about these and the things that we're doing is, you know, how the evolution of our learners, what are we doing differently? And I think, um, you know, again, the idea of like universal design for learning is so important, a topic we could spend weeks on. But the idea of universal design for learning, providing choices and multiple ways to engage and represent and, and show our learning is important. And, and different students learn in different ways. Different students want to share their learning in different ways. Do we have to have students write an essay or could they record a podcast or make a infographic? Are there different ways in which they can do things? Um, you know, those might engage folks more and they might want to do that and be more likely to demonstrate their learning, um, which at the end of the day is what we're after. We want to see sort of folks that are learning, folks that are improving, uh, and, and as it relates to the learning goals and objectives. You know, and then we can kind of just work through an example here. And I think this is just, you know, something that we'll, we'll kind of go through quickly. Uh, but just to think about, you know, what we've been doing and, and how we can leverage sort of design thinking and empathy in this process. So um, in this particular scenario, we have um, our professor, Jane, who's a college English instructor um, and has been teaching the same writing course for several years. But we're seeing sort of declines in overall engagement and retention rates. And this is a story that's that's all too familiar to, to most of us here, probably. So I think we recognize that there's a need maybe to revamp the course. Maybe it's, you know, within that transition into Brightspace now and SUNY is this is an opportunity to, to update our courses. And, and how are we going to go about doing that? Again, I always encourage folks, if, you, if you're a subject matter expert in this scenario, Jane's an English instructor. Jane knows English. But what Jane might not have is that background and experience in an instructional design. So lean into those instructional designers um, that are available to you because their subject matter expertise is instructional design. And we can leverage their expertise along with our own to sort of culminate into a, a design that's going to work for our students. And, and we get into that empathize stage and it's so important that we understand what our needs are for the students. So, you know, as we're having these conversations, we wanna look at different surveys and feedback options that we have available to us. Is there a way to elicit more feedback or information? Can we leverage tools like the, um, you know, data analytics that are in Brightspace to see where students are successful, where they're engaged? Um, you know, you can break things down to see how long students are spending on a particular page, um, you know, so we can see if they're watching a video or engaging with this content. Those, that's information that we can use to see what do students like? What's maybe their preferred learning style? Are they enjoying these YouTube videos that I have here or do they like when I just have a text based content page? And, and you can start to answer some of those questions. And then the idea of empathy mapping is, um, you know, how can we really sort of uh, start to better paint a picture of who that student is that is in our class and the different types of learners that we have? What are their um, perspectives and what are the things that they're looking for and what are the things that they struggle with? And, and when we empathy map, we're now not designing this course for just students as an abstract idea, but we're designing it for these particular students. And, um, you know, we have real people in mind and real ideas or, or at least very real personas of who our students are in mind when we're designing. And we always want to be sure that we're clearly sort of defining those goals and expectations. And, um, you know, we do this through that constant iteration where we're refining that process and we're trying to always make improvements along the way based on what we're seeing. So, you know, based on all that information, where are the specific areas that we can improve? What are the specific needs of our learners? How can we come together to create clear goals for where we're headed next within this process? That ideation stage, again, we're generating ideas. So, you know, it's important that we come up with a lot of different ways to do things. Our students are going to be engaged by those different resources and, and ways to present their knowledge and, and also to learn new things. So the more ideas we have, the more ideas we can bounce off of each other and share, I think the better off we're going to be. Uh, whenever we can offer choice and, and multiple ways to present information, I think it's important that we do that. Um, you know, and we want to create these learning experiences that are sparking curiosity. Um, I think that's a, another, you know, George Carroll's quote that I really like that I'll include here. Um, our job's not to teach memorization, but how can we spark curiosity that empowers students to learn on their own? We want them to wonder, to explore, and to become leaders. So how can we find ideas that do that? How can we shift away from, you've got to memorize this, 
but how can we learn how to do this on our own? And that's really important too, with the way technology I think has shifted today. It's less about how much you remember and can memorize and more about how you can synthesize available information. You know, with tools like Google searches and chat GPT and access to the internet, we can look up anything. You know, if you're a computer programmer, you don't necessarily need to remember every single thing about coding, like maybe you would have, you know, 20 years ago, you can go to ChatGPT and ask questions. Um, you know, even in, in any field, we can do that now. We, we have access to so much information. It's less about can we memorize that information, but more how can we take all of this information that's available to us and put it into meaningful outcomes and use it in a way. So, uh, you know, are there ideas in which we can teach that way and, and provide our students an expectation to learn in that way um, so they're prepared for the real world and prepared for career development? And then we want to make sure we're always prototyping and testing. Again, we're we're trying to sort of build those modules, maybe one at a time. We're we're making small changes. I think you know a, a key sort of takeaway here is that you don't need to blow everything up and start all over, but we can do this sort of one assessment at a time, or one module at a time, or one topic at a time. And and as you're doing that, take that feedback, solicit feedback and information, and make sure that um, you know, our students are feeling heard and what's helping them here is going to show up again down the line. And um, we're making those changes as we go. I think that's a really important thing. Um, keep changing, keep making changes as you go and as needed. And that's that idea of continuous iteration. We're always trying to evolve to make those changes. We're trying to meet and cater to the need, the diverse needs of the, the students that we have today. And the students that we have today are going to be different than the students we have tomorrow. So continuing to keep that in mind that we're never done. Um, it's never really a finished product, I think, is, is one of maybe the most important takeaways for today. All right. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Going through some of the conversation in the yeah. chat too, Dan, um, about examples that people are doing and, you know, giving choice is really appreciated. Um, as you mentioned, we all like, we have different ways that we like to demonstrate our learning and mm -hmm. providing choice wherever possible. is really important. And then I love this idea too of surveying the students throughout the course at different touch points and um, to kind of see how's it going, is this working for you, right? The the way that I have set this up, and and if not, kind of being responsive to the to those changes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Any questions or anything else anybody wants to share? I think you've given us a lot to chew on. Yeah. <laughs> Really great information, though. I appreciate it, um, and I appreciate the the just the impetus to really start thinking about how we're doing things and are we evolving with our students? Are we evolving with the technology that's available to us to try to think better about how we can, you know, design our courses? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll throw my email in the chat there if anybody has anything else you want to continue the conversation or if you're, you'd like to take a, a look at these PowerPoint slides or anything else that I can offer, please feel free to shoot me an email and uh, just let me know. I'm, I'm always happy to do that. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. And we appreciate you sharing today. As always, um, Dan has presented for us before for National Distance Learning Week, and we always learn a lot from, from your contributions. Um, and thank, thank you, you to those of you that attended today. We really appreciate your participation. We do have um, a couple more sessions today and I'll put the link in the chat if you wanna take a look at those. Um, one is actually coming up at 11 and I'm going to keep the Zoom room open for that. So if anybody wanted to stay, you can. Um, that is on International Color Connection, which is actually a showcase of a teaching collaboration between students in Mexico and New York who study the meaning of color in their daily lives, and then they collaborated on international and intercultural activities. So it should be very interesting. Um, and there are other events through the United States Distance Learning Association if you're interested in checking out things around the country this week as well. Thank you so much, Dan, and everyone else. Have a wonderful rest of your day and a good weekend.